Hello, I'm Kathy Bissell. Welcome to the Golf Show 2.0. This week, we're talking to some people who have an 8,000-yard golf course. And we shouldn't say that that's the longest one in the United States. I think there is one at least that long in the East Coast. But this one is the longest one in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, Gary, why don't you introduce our guests who are going to tell us all about it? Well, thanks. We've got uh, Ty Campbell, uh, co-owner, or not sure what the phrase is, of the <laughs> Sylvia <laughs> Valley Ranch Resort. The retreat at Sylvie's Valley Ranch with the Hankins course is the 8,000 yarder. And it was designed by this sadistic guy we know as Dan Hickson. <laughs> Dan, 8,000, why not go to 9,000? Let's... Let's destroy every golfer. But you guys are at altitude <laughs> almost half, almost a mile, right? So that's that's the real reason. But tell us uh, tell us about the original course, Dan, and then the decision to add a few yards to get it to eight thousand recently. Well, it was a, you know, it's a reversible golf course, so we have a counterclockwise and clockwise version, and and the Hankins course is the one that we lengthened out, and it was slightly longer than the the. Craddock course before before this we built some uh extra long tees that we called the pink tees we had about three or four of those and um and we'd sort of always talked about the possibility of making it a lot longer and it, it just uh through time it just kind of became something that we decided to do um instead of just a few holes having these sort of extra long we just decided to kind of do it on all of them and it was a fairly easy process because of the the landscape and the overall layout it, it wasn't a massive endeavor to to build these extra tees well eight thousand is kind of a magic number that's why i changed my name for today's discussion to gary van eight thousand um <laughs> i should mention that uh you guys are in oregon about uh inland due east of uh, uh eugene e eugene in the blue mountains so you're kind of remote and uh, half yes. mile at a uh, mile altitude almost. That's why the ball flies so far. So, uh, Dan, what's what's the longest what's the longest par three you've got on on the Hankins course? Um, that's a great question. They're, I don't have they're, any. They're of the, all long, any of right? The yardages in front of me. Um, I I think the seventh hole ended up being. Gosh, yeah. you know, I don't know. Maybe Ty, do you know those numbers? I don't know what they ended up being at the very end off the top of my head. Um, but uh, I think you're right. I think number seven is going to be the longest one on there. Um, Should have had Torin. He knows the numbers. He has to um, mow them every day. Um, <laughs> well, I know, I know the third hole is a par five. That's 680. So that's correct. That's pretty formidable <laughs> at any altitude, I would think. Oh, yeah. Definitely. And, uh, you know, the ball definitely goes farther at that altitude. And and uh, the the seventh hole that we were talking about, the long par three, which has to be in the it's not 300, but it's probably in the 250 to 60 range. It the last 40 yards before the green are all downhill and, and the green is really receptive. It's a, a, a version of a redan green that with a big downslope in front of it. So uh, a ball that's kind of moving forward that maybe goes 200 yards would easily roll onto the green just due to the high altitude and the, and the grass type, the fescue fairways, the ball really rolls a lot. Well, well that's, in, that's interesting. You have fescue fairways. Everybody yes. in the country is likes to find a place where they can play on fescue because that's the way it is in the British Isles. And yep. we end up not being able to find it. We've got Bermuda, we've got bent, we've got bluegrass, we've got zoiza, but Fescue is a little hard to find, so that's interesting. Yeah, the, it goes well on the coast, and it goes well in desert settings, and we're high desert country, you know, high we're desert, yes. just under 5,000 feet, and uh, and we have a little blue bluegrass mixed in it to give it a little a little substance, because the fescue can be kind of on the thin side as a, as a normal grass, and so the bluegrass sort of gives it a little fluff, makes it um, okay. a little easier to play of, off of, but the ball still can really roll a long way, so it's really fun. Well, we flatlanders in the Midwest, I'm in Pittsburgh, we just don't think of Oregon as high desert because we're not familiar with the area. Um, th that's really interesting because we, we tend to think of it as uh, Portland, rain, mud kind of a thing, and the whole state's not 
that way. You got a lot of different uh, <laughs> environments out there. Yeah, the this whole half oh, of the state, definitely. this whole half of the state um, only gets about nine inches of uh, precip annually, and uh, well over half of that's in snow. So, you know, another thing that helps the ball go a long dang ways is zero humidity. Um, so not only do you have the altitude, but there's nothing interfering with the ball. Um, just because we don't have the water to do it. That's like Palm <laughs> Springs, California. That that's only about a nine inches of rain a year, also, mm -hmm. and that's low desert. So I understand that. I lived there for ten years. Ty, maybe you can tell us what was the inspiration or the idea behind hitting that eight thousand yard marker. Uh, when you know, the course was done, but you had to add what nine hundred and some yards. Whose idea was it? What was the thinking about it? Well, I think it was really uh, Dan and my dad. But um, you know, being out here in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, we we have to create new and exciting things um, to our um, you know golf offerings just just to make it worth coming all this way. And uh, you know, I think. Dan really did a phenomenal job uh, making a gorgeous reversible course, which is something you really can't play anywhere else. Um, and then, you know, we, we, you can't go to, well, I guess you could go to Burns or John Day to play golf, but it's kind of like playing golf on a, I don't know, a flat pancake. Um, there's not a lot of depth and it's not very exciting. Um, and so when you're here, we want to make sure that there are enough activities to keep a golfer really b busy for more than one day. Um, and so the long tees on the 8,000 yard tees, the reversible courses, the short tees on the other course, um, you know, McVeigh's gauntlet, um, the reversible 18 putting courses, you know, we, we've tried to add, um, so many as many unique things in golf as we possibly can so that it's more than worth the trip all the way out here so ty i saw the information about the reversible course and my question is where do you start uh where do you start going the other way around so dan can probably answer this a lot better but um one day you play it clockwise and the next day you play it counterclockwise. So if you're playing from the standard tees, it's the same yardage both ways. Um, but you can only we can only play one course a day. So on um, odd days we play it counterclockwise, and on even days we play it clockwise. Um, if you had them both open on the same day, that would oh, be no. battle golf, and we'd have no, to no. issue helmets to everybody. I, I was just thinking how cool that would be. You got a couple. <laughs> A couple of angry horsemen going at it, and it's it's kind of like uh, the Mongol horde uh, in the in the past, and the three hundred and and all that. That'd be kind of fun. Well, yeah. So I think Kathy's was wondering, uh, Dan. So when you reverse the course, where do you tee off from? Is there a there must be is there a green by the you know the first tee must where where's the eighteenth green then Cause when you come around. I should have sent you pictures of, of. I should have shown you the maps because it's it's okay. it's a complicated explanation. But essentially, it, here's the best way to think of it: is you know a big full scale 18 hole golf course, say the Hankins course. That's the one we just lengthened out, and then yeah. we uh, we tried to lay out the Craddock course over it, but backwards. And so the fairways in particular would be reused, and that was that was right. the genesis of it when when I thought of the idea and, and presented it to Ty and his dad and stuff, the idea of doing something reversible is that we get two golf courses with using about the same property as we would for one. And so, well, uh, but the, the property itself is pretty undulating. It has some beautiful drop-offs and some uphills and downhills and valleys and quite diverse um, ecology out there. And, uh, and so, because it doesn't lay over it exactly perfect where every green is uh, at the end of each fairway, we, we wanted to utilize the property more. So, but basically like the 18th hole on the Hankins course comes down this hill, it's a par five, it drops probably a hundred and some odd feet in elevation. It's about 
I think the new yardage is well over 600. And, but the, the old back yardage was about close, about five, I don't know, 75. I forget the numbers. And then the next day you tee off at an area kind of on a ridge right next to that hole. And the hole plays uphill to a, a different green at the other end of the fairway near the tees for the day before. And it's, it's a par five, but it's a lot shorter. It's only 500 and say 20 from the back. And, uh, and so the golf course, there are nine of the greens that are double, meaning that one day you play to that green and the next day you play that green at a different angle. Okay. And then like there St. are Andrews. nine greens. What's that? Like St. Andrews in Scotland. Correct. Okay. Correct. That's what I'm well, wondering. The, where do you start and cross over to, to get the use well, of your eight well, the thing, green? And your... Yeah. Well, the difference at St. Andrews is they also have double greens daily. They only have 11 greens on their on yes. their golf course and so we have actually 27 greens on ours and so there's there's 18 individual greens you play in one direction only and then there are nine greens oh. that you play in two directions to make 18 and so oh. it's it's not an easy explanation if if i could show you the routing plan maps that you know you play it this way and then the next day you play it this way and they they overlap most of the places but sometimes it just for instance, uh, the eighth hole, we were talking about the seventh, the par three. The eighth hole is a beautiful par four, a, a big drop off tee shot down to a lower fairway. And, and from a certainty, it's drivable if you kind of cut over the forest. But right in front of the tee, there's probably about a 60 to 80 foot drop. You couldn't make a good golf hole that came back up that. Right. Right. It's a beautiful hole going down, but going back up, yeah. it would be no good. And so in order to get back to connect the golf course we built two holes on the other side up a different valley that eventually raise up to that elevation and reconnect okay. so there's they're reversible but there's there's individuality and like ty said and it's it's sort of misleading not that he was trying to mislead but the two courses originally were pretty much the same length but only by coincidence um they're very different when you wouldn't play one and go, Oh gosh, I can't remember. Is that on that course or on that course? They're very different <laughs> golf courses, even though they're on the same property, just going different directions. Well, then there are, I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> no, you did. And Ty, Ty, obviously you and your dad have the land to be able to do that. Whereas some other places would, would not have that extra land available. Yeah, well, the ranch itself is 150,000 acres, and the resort yeah. sits on 5,000. So we're not short on space. <laughs> um, but, you know, another cool aspect of the, um, the routing and the way everything works out is um, a lot, you know, a lot of the fairways crisscross and add to each other. And so, like, when you're hitting off of, um, I think, Craddock number one, because of the way the fairways line up, um, your fairway is over 300 yards wide. Um, wow. And so it's a great way to start your round because you're always going to hit it fair. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the, Dan just did a fantastic job, you know, really making the course um, very playable for somebody like me that's not horribly good at golf. <laughs> um, but also when you want to hit those far shots and really push yourself for the, for the very good golfer, um, there's no way they can get bored on the course either. Um, and so it's very dynamic and a lot of fun for all skill levels. So are you saying nobody's ever missed that first fairway yet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that nobody is in the history has shanked one real right. Um, but it's pretty hard. Pretty hard to miss. I mean, there, there, there are, Dan, there are only a few reversible courses that I know of, but they don't, you're, they don't sound like your, your sounds like one of a kind among yeah. a very rare breed. Yeah. You know, um, when we started, I initially started on this project and saw the property in, in, uh, 2009 and then we didn't really start building it until 10 we sort of laid it out and i staked it and we did a little clearing and cleaned up some of the old logging problems on the pro on the property and uh so we we started it really in 20 2009 or 10 and then uh you know it took us quite a while to build it we were building it more or less in-house 
along with the rest of the resort. And so we were, we weren't in a massive hurry and we had short seasons there because of the altitude. And uh, anyway, so it, after we got started, then Tom Doak's course in Michigan got started and they actually opened before us, but they, they have 18 greens is all. And our course is a lot more free form. And like Ty says, that, that opening tee shot on Hankins is it's 17, one and 18 for Craddock come into it. And so it's just massively wide and it's a very, the best way to describe it is a very free form because, well, because the Campbell's kind of let me go and, and use the property to the best and really create something unique that, uh, you know, you look at it and you go, well, what the heck is this? But it's really, there's another junction out on the golf course where three holes come together as well. And, you know, like you said, it's, you know, a couple hundred over 200 yards wide on that one in the, in the driving zones for each of them. So it makes for some really fun golf. Yeah. Dan, I'll bet you're one of those guys who can solve a Rubik's cube pretty quickly too. <laughs> I do like puzzles. <laughs> I haven't tried a Rubik's Cube in a long time, but uh, I do. It sounds like um, what you've got is a, a really interesting puzzle that you, you piece together ingeniously. Um, well, I guess get back to the 8,000 yards. What kind of feedback have you gotten from the announcement? And the that that number, you know, sends a chill up people's spines, both good <laughs> and bad. It's like 8,000. People want to go ahead, off and play that, and, and others are like, well, we finally hit the day where the ball's going so far. But I'm sure you've gotten some uh, interesting comments so far. Yeah, I mean, the the cool thing is, you know, we you still have your three standard tees on every hole. Um, and so if you set up on the one of the back 8,000-yard tees and you're just like, nope, not this one. <laughs> uh, you can go ahead and play that hole as your normal tee. Um, or if you do miss the 300 yard fairway, you can go, well, this one's going to be a normal tee shot. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, we, uh, it's still very fun and very playable. Um, but you know, those tees are so far back in a lot of places, um, from the original tees that they completely change the picture of the hole. So if you play it, um, 18 on, you know, your standard T, um, you can play it all again on the 8,000 and it just feels like a completely different course. I mean, every, every T looks different. The way you have to, um, do your run-ups and everything are completely different. Um, and so it just gives people a lot more versatility when they're playing there and they can play in the one course all day long and not get tired of it. Um, as far as feedback um, from our guests, um, it's been a little mixed. Um, they love the fact that they can play it and it you know, gives them all day worth of different places to tee off and play all day. Um, there's definitely some where they just gave up and moved in, um, which is okay with us. Predictably. Uh, yeah, so it's been very positive. Everybody's had a good time with it. So. Uh, well, I think there's so many masochistic golfers <laughs> who just want to have the chance to play a course like that. And how bad is it? You know, I, I many years, <laughs> used to, Monday after uh, a major championship, a U.S. Open or PGA, they frequently used to let some of us media guys go out and play it. And you want to play the same tees and, you know, write a story about here's what I shot Joe average handicapper from the same tees. So, you know, Dan, you know, that there, there's so many golfers are masochists. Uh, you must've gotten some, some kind of fan mail about this. Oh, for sure. You know, I think some people's first reaction is like, Oh, that's crazy. Just, you know, golf's gotten too long and all that. But the reality of it is I consulted a lot of courses and do a lot of remodeling. And I'm always recommending country clubs to, if they have places that they can lengthen their course for a reasonable amount of money, you know, not do some crazy stuff. It's good to have your course to, to max out as well as on the short side and to appeal to more golfers. Cause I think, you know, one of the things, just the golfer types right now, there's more diversity in that than ever, because there are, there's, there's a group of people that want to go play the hardest courses in the world there's, you know, there's people that play music now. There's traditionalists. There's people that are kind of into the attire of golf. They're into the equipment of golf. They're into the whole traveling experience. And so there's more, there's more 
kind of subtypes of golfers right now. And so to provide the, that possibility to play something really long is real appealing. I know my la before I got into this business, I was a club pro and at Columbia Edgewater in Portland, Oregon. And that's where I live now. And uh, we used to go out, you know, myself and some of the assistants and maybe some of the back room people. And we would play that course. We would go back crazy distances, you know, 75 yards and tee off in another fairway to, to just play it ultra long. And, you know, at that point, you're not necessarily saying, Hey, I want to see if I can break par on an 8,000 yard course, but you're really just trying to find, you know, more experiences and more different things to use your property differently. And like Ty says, you know, the foreground on these change a lot because the tees are back oftentimes in the sagebrush. And so it might've been where you have to carry a ball, you know, 40 or 50 yards to get out of the sagebrush. Well, if we went back 80 yards, all of a sudden, you know, you're looking, where's that fairway start in front of me? <laughs> and so, um, you know, to me, that's just really fun. And at times, even though I technically, I would be a traditionalist, I've been in the golf, my dad was a golf pro and my brother's a golf pro and I still am you know, golf sometimes is, uh, it's too strict. And like Ty says, it's great for somebody to go back there and play some of those holes, but it, it's, it's certainly not for everybody. And it might be too much for a lot of people, but it just gives them an option to play, you know, a 525 yard par four, sure. <laughs> like, like a tour player. The, so, uh, the you... thing about your re resort is that you don't just have this 8,000 yard course, which has multiple tees. You also have a seven hole course and you have a nine hole course. Yeah. And is there another? I mean, there's an 18 hole reversible putting course. Yeah. Yeah. Why did you, how did you come up with a seven hole course? That that was an interesting concept to me. It, well, that, that really was because the, the very first time I was on the property ever and uh, Ty was there and, and his father, Dr. Campbell, and uh, uh, fourth person and we walked around and we walked into this part of the ground of that 5,000 acres and it's really undulating and but quite small big dry canyons that are uh, you know 80 or 90 feet deep and um, at, at that point um, Dr. Campbell didn't have a great perspective on how big a, a 18 hole golf course would be and yeah. that you know he said can we build it here in this property because it's so striking there's just great views and I said well it's really too compact and severe that we could, you know, we could make a hole that goes into that property and then a par three and then play out of it. And I said, but it would make a great short par three, maybe a par four or two golf course. And so he said, okay, well, let's just do that later. So we built the full <laughs> course and then we built the other par three course. And then he says, I think it's time we go build a course out, which ended up being called McVeigh's gauntlet. And it's, it's almost like um, calendar fantasy golf where it's really just an island out in the sage is the green and the next tee is attached to that. And then you play to another island and you go okay. up and down and over and around. And that was the, that was the origins of the goat caddies. That's where, because it's so <laughs> steep, you wanted to goat to carry your clubs on it. But and and again, that's not built for everybody. Our, uh, our little nine hole par three course, um, uh, Chief Egan par three is, is, is more forgiving and more for, you know, every level of golfer it will enjoy that. So the seven holes sort of just evolved because we just stopped. There's enough room to add. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there was no magic speaking, to it. It's like, yeah, I mean, we'll go over here. <laughs> so, but speaking of goats, there are goats on the, on the property. Ty, why don't you explain to everyone about the, the goat, yeah. their caddies, the goat caddies. Yeah, so um, the ranch is still a commercial um, uh, livestock operation. And so we raise um, about 3,000 head of yearling goats a year. Um, and our Peruvian goat herders um, train those one or two of those goats in each one of the herds of about 1,000 goats um, to carry their lunch and their umbrella oh, and um, dog food for the dogs and water for the dogs. And um, so they're out there every day working with these goats and training them to be pack goats. And then uh, once they um, basically learn to lead on a rope, um, then they get promoted to being a goat caddy. Um, and then they go hang out in our caddy shack. And uh, we have um, uh, special pack saddles that they wear. 
And then we have um, special golf mag- bags made by um, Seamus Golf in Portland. Um, and so they make our goat caddy bags. Um, and then each goat has two bags, one on either side. And then since they're only playing the short courses, um, we have everybody only pick their favorite seven clubs that they want to play the seven or nine okay. with. Um, and because because they, they goats can't handle two full bags. Um, and so they're only carrying about 14 clubs. And then uh, we do one goat caddy per two golfers. And you can either play either one of the short courses. Um, the goats don't have extremely long attention spans. Um, and so <laughs> using them on the 18 would take a very long time. And they would take quite a few siestas. Um, and so we <laughs> only use them on the seven hole courses. But, um, but and then... We normally have a goat caddy for two or three years, and then uh, eventually they get too spoiled because everybody just feeds them peanuts. And so they have to go back into the herd and retrain to be a real pack (laughs) goat. And then we rotate them back into the caddy experience. It's a lot better job opportunity than the alternative. So it's <laughs> funny. They got short attention spans like most people. So I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, well, you go, have you ever gone out in the goat caddy yard and found them like rolling dice for money or playing cards and smoking <laughs> cigarettes? No. And the good news is they work for peanuts. Um, most of, <laughs> Literally but most of their peanuts. advice is bad. Bad. <laughs> and whatever. Oh, other goat I knew there was a bad joke coming in that whole yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ty. I'm glad I didn't have to say it. That's right. Well, you know, one of us had, well, like one of us had to. Ty had the guts. He came up with it. Yeah. I meant to ask you, Dan, does the 8,000 yard course, is there, does it have a course rating or a slope rating? Um, I'm not sure. Has she been out yet and measured it officially, Ty? And not officially it? yet. I think, I think they're coming out next week, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that should be another press release because we're all going to want to know what that is. <laughs> If you got a chance to be the highest slope rated course in the world, that you want to go for that if you can. Yeah, well, but I don't. You know, that wasn't the intent so much. No, of course not. I, yeah. But I, I, I'm just in awe that you designed a golf course in some obviously rugged terrain, and then you figured out a way to make it reversible, Dan. I'm not kidding about the Rubik's cube thing. Yeah, that's that. That took some doing. Well, thank you. It was it was a blast, and it was. Uh... In, in certain ways, it actually became easier once I had had enough guts to ask him about a reversible course because I thought they might think I was crazy. And and for and I tell this story quite a bit is uh, what what's now the third hole on the Craddock course or and the 16th hole of the Hankins course is this beautiful landscape and it's kind of flowing rolls kind of a big valley through it and stuff and um, when you stand where the green is for one of the holes, doesn't matter. And you, and, and that's common when I design is you're always looking around for the right angles of the landscape and you stand on say the 16th green and you look back towards the tee and you go, gosh, that, that's such a beautiful hole there. And so then you walk up to the green on the other end and you look back and you go, wow, that's a beautiful hole. And so I would have had to decide, are we going to play that hole that way or this way? Yeah. If we do a non-reversible course, but now that decision was easy. I could build, you know, it could go either way. And so in, in some ways it became easier because you didn't have to make those hard decisions, you know, and that's in a routing plan for 18 holes. You may have the most spectacular hole on the course, but you have to build three holes to get to it that are no good yeah. you know, to make it fit, you know? Yeah. And so by doing it that way and then having the freedom to go a little bit overboard and kind of, like I said, the free form aspect of it, where we didn't have to be real strict from T to green, every hole backwards. Um, it just really gave me the freedom to do some stuff that you just normally would, you wouldn't do any other way. So it was, it was very difficult to put the details together, but oftentimes the bigger conceptual stuff kind of fell into place easier. So. Yeah, Ty, before, before we started all four talking together, uh, you had mentioned that you have people who will ask to walk the golf course. And why don't you explain what happens when they do that? Because you're at, ele- you're at uh, a mile up, you're at elevation. Yeah, we have a, a, you know, a lot of guys that play at sea level um, and they're hardcore walkers um, or they just came over here from 
band in uh, anywhere else that's at sea level. Um, and they're, you know, used to flat courses, but you know, we have over 300 feet of elevation change more or less from the bottom to the top and you got to do it twice. And then we're at um, a little over the top of the course, a little over 5,000 feet. So you're about a mile. Um, we have a lot of our hardcore walkers that will do about nine holes and then come back and say, you're right. The, the cart was a good idea. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a lot of elevation change. And uh, when you're not used to the air being this thin, um, yeah. it can really take it out of you. But um, you know, and then it helps on the other side too. You can shoot it, you can hit it that much further. So <laughs> is, is there one hole, Dan or Ty on, on the Hankins course? Is there one hole that the resort guests when they get done, is there one hole they're all talking about afterwards? The most memorable hole? Oh, or do you have 18 of them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, everybody normally has a different favorite, um, you know, and it's a, if they, if they play it more than once, they've got more than one favorite, um, you know, because it's so dynamic and there's so many different ways to play it that, you know, even playing the exact same course twice in a day, you have different opinions on every, every hole. So um, I can't say that there's a favorite right off the top of my head. I'm sure Dan probably has had people go, why the heck did you do that for? But um, <laughs> uh, but people tend to like it all. So. Yeah, there's definitely not a, a, a design signature hole of any sort. And, that, and that's, you know, I do that on all my course. I don't necessarily want to build just that one hole that stands out. And like I said, you may have compromised other holes to make it happen. And so, uh, and that I think that's real rewarding when a foursome comes in and they all have four different favorite holes. That's and, good. Uh, yeah, do do so, they tend to, on the reversible thing, do they tend to like the original or the reversible? Or does it depend, well, like Band of Dunes, it usually depends on whichever course they played first is their favorite. Um, The differences are really, the, the yardages are pretty equal. I mean, they, and, and not hold the hole, but just total. And the Hankins course generally has, I'd say most people consider it has the prettier views. It has a little more of the downhill with the big striking uh, sight lines and view sheds. Um, the Craddock course, I think the bunkering is a little more in play. You have to carry some bunkers around the greens a little bit more. I personally, you know, 51% maybe like the Craddock. I think it's just the, the challenge for me as a golfer. I think I like that a little bit more. Um, but it's just as beautiful, maybe just not as striking because of some of the downhill effects. And so I, I would say you know, just talking, uh, generally the, I think even the Raiders, you know, golf week and golf digest and all the, all our different Raiders have come out and they, they have j just a slight edge to, um, Hankins. So of course I'm going to take the opposite. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> because that's probably the one that's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, there is no, it's subjective and, and we all know that. And so, um, you know, but I think it really is the vistas that really give Hankins the edge. I mean, yeah. I don't think I think if you played with blinders, I think it's six in one, half a dozen in the other. They're both fun, dynamic yeah. courses. Well, I, I wasn't that familiar with the resort until I went and looked online. I would encourage people to do that. Uh, the retreat at Sylvie's Valley Ranch has got everything. It's pretty <laughs> incredible when you watch the video. It makes you want to go there. And now we're going to drop our shameless plug. Subscribe. It's free. <laughs> Just click on subscribe. Click on like. We don't, nothing will happen. You won't get an email. <laughs> and our goal, our long term goal, we're still at it. We're hoping to earn 17 cents in royalties for the Golf Show 2.0. <laughs> no, I know it seems like absurd to aim that high. You're incredibly <laughs> ambitious. We're really, we're really going after it. So, uh, what, yeah, what's, what's the website, Ty? Um, it's just sylvies.us or sylviesvalleyranch.com, either one. Yeah, there's a video on there, and once you get done watching that, but you've got all the activities. you got a, you got a, you got a spa. You've got uh, – I you think got there was fishing, horseback spa. riding, ATV. Yep. Uh, all kinds of golf. you got – you can mingle with goats. <laughs> 
Yep, everything is. from horseback riding to shooting. Um, it's about. Yeah, I think all place. you really need to say is, "Hey, we got a resort with goats." <laughs> there and you that's, go. That's it. You just stop it there. That's all you need to say. It <laughs> looks right. like a great place. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, explaining your eight thousand yard course and your other courses and obviously beautiful facilities to us. And Thank uh, you. good luck with us. Let us know how you're doing. Thank <laughs> you.